The way we know this is a tool instead of just a broken rock is that it's broken in um, a very particular way. Breaking a flake off this way, that way, this way, back and forth. So there is a method behind how this rock was broken in, in order to make it into a tool, and it's not a random method. It's considered unlikely they were made by Australopithecus, Lucy's kind. So Australopithecus was around for a couple of million years and did not make stone tools. But if not Lucy's kind, then who? The gap in the fossil record makes it difficult to say. But that's not surprising. Tools preserve easily. Bones, much less so. Finally, the skulls of a new creature begin to turn up. Is this the tool maker? The skulls are different from what came before. They represent the dawn of a new era, beginning around two million years ago. This is our era, the era of the genus Homo, humans. The mysterious toolmaker, Homo habilis, is the first of these new creatures. But we definitely have evidence that the stone tools were being used to to break the long bones in order to get to the marrow inside the long bones. There were clear cut marks on the bones of turtles, crocodiles, big antelopes, little antelopes, even hippos, really big animals like hippos. So we know that meat had become an, a new important part of the diet of Homo habilis. The first fossil to be called Homo habilis included 21 bones of the hand and was nicknamed Handyman. This little bone is the bone at the end of the thumb. And that little bone in Homo habilis, like in humans, is very broad. And the broad bone reflects having a broad pad on the thumb with a lot of surface area for fine precision grip. With newly dexterous hands, this creature could make better tools. But what was it like? The few skeletal bones that have been found indicate a creature much smaller than us, about the same size as Lucy and Salam's kind, Australopithecus, three to four feet tall. Homo habilis was still ape-like in many ways, but with a critical difference. What we see in the evolution of Homo habilis is an expansion in the brain size compared to Australopithecus. So here is the skull of Australopithecus, and it has no forehead. It just has a straight slope behind the orbits. Whereas here in Homo habilis, you see um, a sloping, elevated forehead. And in Australopithecus, the area behind the orbits is pinched in, also reflecting a small frontal region. In contrast, in Homo habilis, we see an expansion of that area behind the orbits that points to an expansion in the cognitive capabilities of higher functions of the higher reasoning functions of the brain. It was an expansion equivalent to a doubling of brain volume. Once you go from something like 400 cc's in Australopithecines to say 700, 800 cc's in Homo habilis, yes, you're getting, getting a big increase in cognitive capacity. And along with his bigger brain, Homo habilis was starting to look a lot more human. The contours of fossil skulls allow reconstructionist Victor Deke to reveal the faces of early human beings. Gone is the projecting snout of an ape. In Homo habilis, the face of humanity is emerging. This poses a great enigma. Why, after millions of years of flatlining, did brain size and mental capacities suddenly take off? Two million years ago, what jump-started human evolution? Scientists all over Africa looked for clues. 
Here in Kenya, they found some at the southern end of the Great Rift Valley. It's a hotbed of tectonic activity where ancient layers are forced to the surface. 10 million years ago, Africa was a much wetter place. A tropical jungle which has been slowly drying out ever since. But these rocks in Kenya show that Africa's gradual drying trend was punctuated by bursts of wild climate fluctuation. Rick Potts is an expert in reading the rocks. This layer right here represents about a thousand years of environmental stability, but then we had an abrupt volcanic eruption, and then the lake was around for perhaps 500 years before a drought, and the lake came back. So in some cases, we saw this through layer after layer of environmental change. With his trained eye, Rick could see some layers were once lake beds, others desert sands. Still others came from volcanic eruptions, a snapshot of a million years of climate history. This observation led him to an amazing new idea, rapid change as a catalyst for our evolution. And I began to think that, well, maybe it's not the particular environment of a savanna that was important, but the tendency of the environment to change. Could it be that the need to survive violent swings of climate made our ancestors more adaptable? A group of scientists has come here from Germany to find out just how radical these swings of climate really were. It's hard to believe, but these huge rock formations are made of the shells of tiny one-celled organisms called diatoms. There are many different kinds, but they all live in water. Their shells collect in layers of rock that pile up over millions of years, proving that this whole valley was once a giant lake. Annette Junginger analyzes these rock samples under the microscope. What I've di discovered was that those white layers consist of a special kind of diatoms which only live in deep lakes. But between the white layers, she also finds other species of diatoms which only live in shallow water. It means that in this spot, a massive lake appeared and disappeared and reappeared many times. These lakes are, are really significant. These are not small little ponds. And what we've been able to document now is, is a series of lakes that are cycling. When we're talking freshwater lakes, the size of Lake Victoria filling the whole Rift Valley and then disappearing. Enormous amount of water rushing through this area. This constant flux of turnover, of change. An awful time to live here. It's not just a unidirectional change, it's going back and forth. Against the backdrop of a slow drying trend, Africa was periodically pulsing with climate change. Wet, dry, 